Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk about simple harmonic motion, but specifically I want to talk about mass spring oscillators in simple harmonic motion. Our objectives for today are going to be to derive and apply the expression for the period of oscillation of a mass on a spring. We'll take a look at how we do that when the mass and spring are hanging vertically as well. And finally, we'll determine the period of oscillations for systems of springs when they're in series or in parallel configurations when we have multiple springs involved. So with that, why don't we dive in and we'll start with the horizontal spring oscillator. And we touched on this briefly in the simple harmonic motion video, but I think it's worthwhile to spend a little more time on it, go a little more slowly and make sure we've got this one down because this is the basis of the rest of our analysis for today. If I look at this spring, that has some spring constant k attached to a wall and over here we have a mass m that oscillates back and forth from its equilibrium point x equals zero to x equals negative a and back and forth to a it's in simple harmonic motion and as we analyze that it should be pretty easy to see using newton's second law that force is equal to mass times acceleration but our force by hooke's law is minus kx it's a restoring force and if we also realize that the acceleration is the second derivative of x with respect to, respect to time, then we could rewrite this to say that m, second derivative of x with respect to time, must equal minus kx. Or with a little bit of rearrangement, we could say that d squared x over dt squared plus k over m times x equals zero. And that's a basic equation, second order differential equation, that leads us right away to simple harmonic motion. What function, second, second, what functions, second derivative, added to a constant times that function itself can give you zero? Has to be a sine or a cosine function. And as we determined previously, the general solution to this differential equation is that x as a function of time is going to be equal to the amplitude, some constant a, times the cosine of omega t plus any phase shift we might have. And we're not going to worry a whole lot about phase shift today. And when we look at this, this form, this k over m, based on our generic form, is equal to omega squared. So if that's omega squared, it's pretty easy to see then that omega, our angular frequency, must be equal to the square root of that or the square root of k over m. Now if we want to find the period of oscillation, remember that period t is 2 pi over omega, where again omega is square root of k over m. So that's going to be 2 pi over the square root of k over m, which is equal to 2 pi square root of m over k. And that formula may look familiar to you. That's the formula that they oftentimes have you memorize for the period of a mass spring oscillator. t equals 2 pi square root of m over k. That's how we derive it. That's where that function comes from. All right, so now let's take a look at this vertical spring oscillator. We have a mass hanging from a spring, and we're going to let it settle out until y is equal to some y equilibrium. It's come to some nice happy position. We're then going to pull it down or up and let it oscillate back and forth around that equilibrium position from some amplitude y equals negative a to a and back and forth. So I'm going to start with the free body diagram of this mass when it's in its equilibrium position. We've got the force of gravity or its weight down, and we have the force of the spring ky pointing up. So again, we'll start with Newton's second law and write that the net force in the y direction is going to be mg minus ky. And that's going to be equal to mass times the acceleration in the y direction. And if we let it reach equilibrium, then our acceleration is going to be zero. So that means if it's in equilibrium, that mg minus k y in the equilibrium position must equal zero. Or we could say that the equilibrium position of y is just going to be equal to mg over k. So that's where y equilibrium is going to be positioned. 
Now, once the system is settled at equilibrium again, we're gonna set the mass in motion by pulling it some amount to either plus A or minus A. The new system then can be analyzed as follows. We'll start off again with Newton's second law in the y direction. That's going to be mg minus, still have the same spring, same spring constant, but now our y is just going to be y equilibrium plus whatever that amplitude is, a. Or that's mg minus ky equilibrium minus ka, if I distribute out the k. But if you remember, we just proved up here mg minus ky equivalent equals zero. So that must be equal to zero. So we could write the rest of our equation then as net force in the y direction is equal to minus ka. That's the same analysis we would do for a horizontal spring system with spring constant k that's displaced some amount a from its equilibrium position. In short, to analyze the vertical spring system, all we do is we find that new equilibrium position, taking into account the effect of gravity, exactly what we did right up here. Then we treat it as a system with only the spring force to deal with, oscillating around that new equilibrium point. No need to continue to deal with the force of gravity there. We've already taken care of it in our analysis. Makes it nice and slick. So that's how we would deal with the vertical spring oscillator system. Well then, what happens if you have more than one spring in a system? What happens if we have two springs in series, K1 and K2? We bring our mass out to some equilibrium position and we let it oscillate back and forth between negative A and A. All right, well in this case, let's take a look and see what we can find. Our force is going to be equal to minus K1 X1 that's the force on our spring. And of course, that's got to be equal to the force from spring two, Newton's third law. Therefore, it's pretty easy for us to solve to say that x1 must be equal to k2 over k1 times x2. We're going to come back to that in a minute. We can also look at this from the standpoint of we have some equivalent spring that's equivalent to having both of these springs together. So we're going to replace K1 and K2 with some equivalent spring. If I take a look at analysis that way, I would say that the force must be equal to some equivalent spring constant times our combined X1 plus X2, the displacements due to each of those springs. Now when I do that then, I can use the fact that X1 equals K2 over K1 times X2 to rearrange this to say that the force must be equal to minus K equivalent. Now replacing X1 with K2 over K1 X2 plus X2. And a little bit more algebra since we also know that our force is equal to minus K2 X2. That comes from that f equals minus k2 x2. We can take this simplification a little bit further to say that k2 x2, just replacing f with minus k2 x2, gonna get rid of our neg negative signs at the same time, must be equal to our equivalent k, pull out the x2, and I'm left with k2 over k1 plus one. Or, going just a little bit further still. Divide x2 from both sides. k2 must equal our equivalent k times k2 over k1 plus one. Or a little bit more algebraic rearrangement and I find out that one over the equivalent k must be equal to one over k1 plus one over K2. Kind of looks like resistors in parallel or capacitors in series. Very, very close analogy here. So we have a formula now for the equivalent spring constant for springs that are in series. Right away, you could probably start to guess what's gonna happen when we look at springs in parallel. 
If these are like capacitors in series or resistors in parallel, we expect that the springs in parallel are going to look like capacitors in parallel or resistors in series. They should add. Let's see if we can't prove that. So now we have our springs in parallel. We have K1 attached to M and K2 attached to M. And notice that the X has to be the same for both of these. So as we take a look at this, we could say that the force must be equal to K1X plus K2X, the force of spring one plus the force of spring two. Or that's K1 plus K2X. Pretty easy to see then that if that's going to be equal to some K equivalent, that K1 plus K2X must be equal to our K equivalent times X. And if we divide X out of both sides, then we get that the equivalent spring constant must be equal to K1 plus K2, exactly as we predicted. So different ways we can deal with systems of springs. All right, hopefully that gets you started with the analysis of mass spring oscillators and spring systems for calculus-based physics courses. If you need more help or looking for assistance, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.